Biology 153 students. Thanks for uh, logging on uh, to listen to this lecture. I'm hoping that we can do this in um, an hour or less and uh, make up the lecture that was missed on Wednesday due to the weather. Uh, this is the beginning of the next notes package, which is the package on respiratory physiology. Now I haven't used this technology before, so uh, there may be some glitches along the way, so bear with me um, if uh, things go awry. So respiration involves three main processes. The first of these is breathing, which we call pulmonary ventilation. This is the act of inhaling and exhaling, or moving air in and out of the lungs. The second process in respiration is gas exchange. There is two aspects to gas exchange. One we call external respiration, which is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air, uh, which is in the lungs, of course, and the pulmonary capillary blood. The second is called internal respiration, and that's exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between blood and the cells or tissues of the body. The third process in respiration is transport, and this includes the transport of both oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood by the cardiovascular system. Now I suspect I'm going to be moving fairly quickly through this presentation just because I can't watch you actually writing this down as you fill in your notes package, so I'm hoping that you can slow this down or back up uh, as required. We'll start with pulmonary ventilation, which, as I mentioned, involves inhalation and exhalation, or inspiration and expiration. And the measurement of uh, lung volumes involved in uh, ventilation is, of course, what we did in the lab, and we call that spirometry. Air will always move uh, from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. And these pressure gradients drive the movement of air into the lungs and out of the lungs. They also drive weather systems on the planet. So um, air in the atmosphere also is movement is driven by pressure gradients as well. Now the pressure we're talking about is air pressure and air molecules will basically expand to fill a space and they exert pressure on the environment around them and that is uh, the kind of pressure that we're talking about here. So during ventilation, inhaling and exhaling, the direction the air moves either into the lungs or out of the lungs is going to be determined by differences between atmospheric pressure, the pressure in the atmosphere around you, versus intrapulmonary pressure. If pressure in the lungs is high, higher than atmospheric pressure, then uh, air will be pushed out of the lungs. If pressure in the lungs is lower, air will be pulled into the lungs. So atmospheric pressure is the pressure exerted by the air in the atmosphere and all of the air molecules uh, that are in the atmosphere exert an, a certain amount of pressure. Atmospheric pressure is lowest, uh, closest to the surface of the Earth at sea level, where we live in Victoria, for example, and as you go up in altitude, there are uh, fewer air molecules um, pressing down on you, so the atmospheric pressure decreases. But at sea level, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. And uh, this is a number I think you should know. It's a useful number for some calculations that we're going to do. And in Victoria, that is approximately the atmospheric pressure here. Intrapulmonary pressure, of course, is the air pressure in the lungs. And this would be within the alveoli of the lungs. And this changes. Unlike atmospheric pressure, intrapulmonary pressure varies with lung volume. When you have the same number of air molecules in a larger volume, the air pressure there will be lower. When you compress those same air molecules into smaller volume, then the air pressure in the lungs will be higher. So just to illustrate this process, when your diaphragm is relaxed, you have just finished exhaling, for example, the 
pressure in the alveoli of the lungs will be the same as atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury. But when you contract your diaphragm and the diaphragm drops, that increases the lung volume and the space in the thoracic cavity. And those same air molecules now are in a larger volume. So the intrapulmonary pressure drops just slightly. You'll notice from 760 to 758, but it's a big enough drop to pull air into the lungs. There's a law. There's always a law. Boyle's law uh, suggests, and I think you all understand this law without perhaps knowing that it has a name. If you decrease the volume of space containing a gas, so you compress it. This is the sort of thing that you would do, for example, when carbon dioxide is put into a carbonated beverage bottle. The pressure inside that space increases. And then if you increase the volume of a space containing a gas, the pressure will decrease. So when you take the cap off a carbonated bottle, all of a sudden there's a lot of additional space that the air molecules can expand into and the carbon dioxide bubbles uh, bubble up into the atmosphere. So gases, unlike solids or liquids, will basically expand to fill a space. And the smaller the space, the lower the pressure in that space. Or the smaller the space, the higher the pressure that will be exerted inside that space. So let's look at inhalation. Inhalation or inspiration involves expansion of the thoracic cavity so that the volume of the Uh, chest cavity or thoracic cavity uh, increases and this effectively lowers the pressure of the air inside the lungs. So you have the same number of air molecules in a larger space. In this scenario, intrapulmonary pressure is lower than atmospheric pressure and that results in air moving from outside to the inside of the lungs from high to low pressure. Now inhalation, as all of you know, is an active process. It involves the contraction of muscles. It requires effort. And one of the main muscles, uh, one of the smaller groups of muscles for um, uh, inhalation are the external intercostals. And when these contract, the ribs are lifted. So the chest cavity expands. And then of course the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is a large sheet of mus muscle which drops when it contracts, it goes from being curve, curved to flattening as it contracts. And uh, the net effect is to effectively expand the chest cavity wall and uh, increase the volume in the uh, lungs. So inhalation involves contraction of the external intercostals and the diaphragm. So there are a number of accessory muscles involved in inhalation, uh, including the sternocleidomastoid, the pectoralis minor, muscles called the scalenes and the serratus anterior, all of which uh, mainly function to lift the ribs. And uh, this is not something uh, I expect you to memorize, but I think it's worth uh, making note of. So you have a little picture here showing you effectively what happens when you inhale. So the first picture is in the uh, diaphragm relaxed state where the pressure in the lungs will be effectively the same as atmospheric pressure. So if we map this out, atmospheric pressure is 760. Intrapulmonary pressure, the pressure in the alveoli is also 760. In the second picture, it shows you what happens when uh, the External intercostals contract, so the ribs lift to expand the chest cavity, and the diaphragm drops also to expand that space. So in the second scenario, atmospheric pressure, so the diaphragm drops, external intercostals lift the ribs, atmospheric pressure is still the same at 760, but the air molecules are now in a larger volume so at pressure intra in the lungs, intrapulmonary pressure drops to about 758 millimeters of mercury. This pulls air into the lungs. It's basically sucked in as the air moves from high pressure to low pressure. 
So the bottom line is muscle contraction and effort is required to inhale. Let's take a look at exhalation. I think most of us are aware that inhalation requires effort, but exhalation is a very relaxing um, process. It does not require, pass in passive breathing, doesn't require any muscle effort. So this um, image shows you, just uh, seen from the side of the body, the effect of the lifting of the external intercostals, which are shown at the bottom of the diagram on the right, and the dropping of the diaphragm. So just to remind you a little bit about the anatomy. I also like this image because it shows you some of the other muscles, which we, we didn't study in the muscle lab except for the sternocleidomastoid, but you'll see that all of them have um, an insertion on the ribs somewhere so they can also assist with the lifting of the ribs, including the pectoralis major, sternocleidomastoid, serratus, and uh, scalene muscles. Exhalation. So exhalation or expiration involves relaxation of those muscles that contracted to expand the thoracic cavity and also elastic recoil as air is pushed out of the lungs uh, when the elastic tissue surrounding the alveoli basically um, squeezes the alveoli as the elastic fibers uh, return to their original shape and size. It's a passive process during quiet breathing. And quiet breathing is no, known as eupnea. And it's very much dependent on um, elasticity of the lung tissue. I think in the lab I demonstrated how I could fill the pig's lungs with air. And then when I pulled the um, air delivery hose out, the, the lungs just recoiled back to their original shape. And this is because of the inherent elasticity. And if you take a look at the little pictures at the bottom of the PowerPoint, you can see some of the elastic fibers. They actually wrap around the surface of each of the alveoli. So this elastic connective tissue of the lungs is very important in the elastic recoil of the lungs and the process of passive uh, exhalation. So this is the kind of exhalation that occurs with quiet, normal breathing, such as the breathing you would be doing now. It is, of course, possible to forcefully exhale air, and this is something you would have done in the lab when you were measuring forced expiratory volume. And it's possible to push a lot more air out of the alveoli. So this kind of breathing is called forced breathing or hyperpnea. And it actually uses muscles. And if you take a moment here to inhale deeply and then exhale as hard as you can, exhaling as much air as possible, you will realize that the ribs are being pulled down. This is the uh, action of the internal intercostal muscles. And in particular, I think you'll notice that you compress your abdomen. So the rectus abdominis and all of the other uh, abdominal muscles contract to um, put pressure on the abdominal pelvic cavity, which helps to put pressure on the underside of the diaphragm and push air out. So the internal intercostals contract to depress the ribs, and the abdominal muscles contract to compress the abdomen which push, helps to push air out from the bottom of the diaphragm. This kind of forced breathing would also occur, for example, with coughing or sneezing, where you're forcefully exhaling. So you may be asking yourself uh, about 
the lifting of the ribs and uh, the expansion of the lungs because they are actually separate processes, but they are coupled. So the muscles uh, change the volume of the thoracic cavity. You lift the ribs, uh, lower the diaphragm, uh, or conversely uh, compress the bottom of the diaphragm and pull the ribs down. But uh, the lungs lie within the thoracic cavity and lie, of course, within the pleural membranes that form the pleural cavity. And what actually happens is there is a physical connection, which is a water-to-water wet surface to wet surface kind of attraction between the uh, pleura of the lungs and the um, thoracic cavity uh, itself so that the uh, serous fluid, the moisture there, actually makes the surface of the lungs stick to the inside of the thoracic cavity so that when the ribs lift, the surface of the lungs, the pleural membranes, are actually pulled with it. So this is due to properties of water. Water is a very polar molecule and as you know, wet things stick to wet things. If you got your shirt wet, it would cling to your skin. So it's these wet surfaces sticking to wet surfaces so that coupling of the um, expansion of the thoracic cavity and expansion of the lungs occurs. So what prevents the lungs from collapsing when you exhale? So this process is called atelectasis, and perhaps a little bit confusing to understand, but it has to do with elasticity of the lungs, the elastic recoil of the lungs, and also this uh, fluid uh, or surface tension connection between the wet membranes that um, are inside the body. But intrapleural pressure is the space within the, is the pressure within the pleural cavity itself. So it's the pressure um, between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. And this pressure is always slightly lower than intrapulmonary pressure, the pressure in the lungs. The effect is a suctioning kind of effect. It's only a difference of a few millimeters of mercury in terms of pressure difference, but it, it creates a suctioning of the uh, pleura to the inside of the thoracic cavity. I think perhaps the best way to visualize this would be to imagine those suction cups you can use to stick something onto a window or glass of some kind. And what you do when you want a suction cup to stick to something is you push on it. And what you're doing there is actually pushing a little bit of the air out of that space and you're effectively creating a little bit of negative pressure so that you get uh, the suction cup basically held into place, stuck to the window or uh, to the wall by uh, this pressure difference of just a little bit. So it's a suction cup kind of effect, a little bit tricky I think to understand, but um, perhaps a little easier to visualize it if you think of it in terms of a suction, a su suction cup. So you have a little diagram here and i um, just going to ask you to take a few moments to label the thoracic wall, uh, the lung, itself, the diaphragm, the visceral pleura, parietal pleura, and then to add um, the pressure values in the right places. And those pressure values are indicated at the bottom of the diagram. So since we're somewhat limited for time, I think rather than just giving you time to fill all of this in, I'm just going to proceed with the labeling exercise, but I think it would be an excellent review exercise for you to um, do this on your own if you wish to just uh, skip this part and just come back to it and see how you make out with it. So in this diagram, the thoracic wall is indicated by the orange uh, color, and two, of course, is uh, the label for the lung. Three is the diaphragm. Four is indicating one of the pleural membranes, the parietal pleura. Five is the visceral pleura on the surface of the lungs. And six, of course, is the pleural cavity. So as mentioned, 
there is a slight difference in pressure between intrapleural and intrapulmonary spaces, and we call this the transpulmonary pressure. The pressure in the pleural cavity itself is slightly lower, at about 756 millimeters of mercury. The pressure in the lungs, the intrapulmonary pressure around 760 when the diaphragm is relaxed, or perhaps 758 if the diaphragm is contracted. But regardless of uh, where the diaphragm is at and what the pressure is in the intrapulmonary spaces, the intrapleural pressure will always be slightly lower. So that transpulmonary pressure creates a suction-like effect where the membranes of the on the surface of the lungs, the vis visceral pleura, is uh, coupled to the parietal pleura, which is stuck to the thoracic wall by fluid bonds. Uh, those pressure differences cause the lungs to expand when the uh, thoracic wall lifts and expands. So transpulmonary pressure is the difference between the intrapulmonary pressure and the intrapleural pressure, and it's a difference of about 4 millimeters of mercury. And this, this difference is pretty constant, whether you're inhaling or exhaling. That coupling of the um, membranes to the wall is uh, maintained when you breathe. So if you look at this graph, it shows the sort of constancy of this transpulmonary pressure. So this shows you um, inhaling and exhaling, but that difference of about 4 millimeters is uh, always maintained. This prevents lung, lung collapse. If you uh, had a lung puncture, however, so that you effectively um, made the pressure in the intrapulmonary space and the intrapleural space the same as atmospheric pressure, you would uncouple the membranes from the thoracic wall and you would have what's called a collapsed lung. And air uh, enters the intrapleural space and that pressure difference is no longer maintained. And this condition is called a pneumothorax and uh, it's also more commonly known as a collapsed lung. And when this happens, they actually physically have to go in and remove that air and allow uh, the membranes to reestablish that connection with the thoracic wall and um, allow that pressure difference to uh, be restored before you can um, breathe. In this scenario where you have a collapsed lung, you can lift the uh, thoracic wall, lift the ribs, drop the diaphragm, but uh, the lung is surface is no longer uh, coupled to those movements, so no inhalation occurs. Just for your information, and I'll move quickly through this, there are many non-respiratory air movements, of course. Uh, coughing or sneezing is a type of forced uh, expiration, and uh, anyone I think who's done a lot of coughing will know that you can get sore abs, and your ribs may also feel sore from this, and that is the um, muscles of exhalation that are being overworked. Crying, laughing, very interesting respiratory movements. They both, from a physiological perspective, are exactly the same. They involve these deep inspirations and short, rapid expirations. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> They're emotionally induced, and hopefully none of you are crying or laughing at this moment. But um, these are physiologically basically the same from a respiratory perspective. They're, um, they can't be differentiated, which is why it's so easy, I think, to go from crying to laughing or laughing to crying. Hiccups, for the record, are uh, thought to be spasms of the diaphragm, which are these sudden little inspirations. And the noise you get with a hiccup is apparently air hip hitting the glottis. Yawn. Go ahead, get it over with, just have a big yawn right there, uh, are 
just it's just a very deep inspiration. It's known to uh, ventilate all the alveoli. Why mammals yawn is poorly understood. Uh, there's lots of theories. Um, nobody's too sure why we yawn. Yeah, Guinness World Book of Records, Charles Osborne apparently hiccuped for 68 years, if you can imagine. So factors affecting ventilation. We're going to look at some of the things that uh, affect ventilation and the, uh, a lot of these uh, important ones, and we've alluded to these in the lab already, involve uh, resistance to airflow. So airway resistance, or AR, is one key factor. And this is basically the amount of friction along the respiratory passages as air moves in or out of the lungs. Now, airway resistance is something that varies. It is highest in the smallest respiratory passages, just as uh, peripheral resistance in the circulatory system is highest in the smallest blood vessels. So the bronchioles, which have very small diameter, uh, have the highest airway resistance of all. There's lots of them, and small changes in bronchiolar diameter have a huge impact on airway resistance. Bronchoconstriction, where the, the diameter of the bronchioles is narrower, will increase airway resistance. This will make breathing much more strenuous and the movement of air in and out of the lungs much more difficult. So you should recall that the bronchioles are very small, um, a millimeter or less, uh, air passages lined in pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium and wrapped in smooth muscle. There's no cartilage around these, um, this part of the respiratory tree. And when the smooth muscle of the bronchioles contracts, bronchoconstriction occurs and airway resistance increases. Surface tension is another consideration. So surface tension is a property of uh, wet surfaces and is related to the polar bonds that water molecules form. And it is uh, quite a unique property associated with uh, uh, water and uh, wet membranes or wet surfaces. And this surface tension, and you can imagine it for example, as the effort required to peel a wet t-shirt off, as opposed to taking a dry t-shirt off, there is this stickiness and clinginess that has to be overcome. And the same thing is true inside the lungs. All of the uh, alveoli are moist, and these moist little air sacs uh, can stick to each other, and there's a certain amount of fluid tension that has to be overcome, in fact, to inflate them. They're a little bit like wet balloons. So the liquid film on the alveolar walls um, creates this surface tension that has to be overcome in order to fill uh, the lungs with air. So surfactant is a substance which is much like detergent. It's oily and slippery. It's secreted by special cells uh, that line the alveoli called type 2 alveolar cells. And surfactant makes the inside of the alveoli slippery and reduces the surface tension and water-to-water -water attraction um, that would happen uh, in just wet alveoli and surfactant actually prevents the alveoli from collapsing and uh, makes it much easier to inflate the alveoli with air. It just makes the inside of the alve each alveolus less sticky. It reduces surface tension effectively. Now the production of surfactant in fetuses actually begins fairly late in gestation and one of the big issues with premature babies is a disorder called infant respiratory distress syndrome 
and this is a syndrome that is due to insufficient surfactant production and uh, neonates born prematurely can't actually inflate their alveoli because of the surface tension in each of the alveolus is in the lungs and what happens is they need to be positively ventilated so air is pushed into the lungs and they can actually administer surfactant um, as a kind of a spray but surfactant is very important in um, reducing surface tension in the lungs so lung compliance is another term that uh, another factor that affects ventilation and compliance in this case refers to the ease with which the lungs can be expanded and this is affected by a number of factors most notably the amount of surfactant so insufficient surfactant would make it very difficult to expand the lungs also the elasticity of the connective tissues associated with the lungs if elastic tissue around the alveoli um, is replaced with fibrous tissue then it is very difficult to expand the lungs that elastic connective tissue needs to be stretchy and the flexibility of the rib cage is also a factor anything that um, affects the ability of the rib cage to lift and expand will make it more difficult for uh, the lungs to expand that would include uh, arthritis for example with aging uh, where the rib cage can be affected and also things like obesity where uh, just body mass may actually affect ease of expansion so obesity is a factor as well So there's a number of factors here I'm going to ask you to work on on your own and perhaps we can go over these in tutorial but ask you to consider what effect each of the factors outlined uh, at the bottom of your notes page there would have on ventilation and why. So tell me increase decrease uh, ventilation and use uh, some of the factors we just discussed to explain uh, why there is or is not a, an effect. Emphysema is uh, a health issue that we examined in the labs. You looked at slides of emphysemic lungs and what you should have noticed is that the alveoli in emphysemic patients are very large and there are many fewer alveoli. Emphysema is a disease of smokers typically and it's characterized by destruction of the elastic tissue and also the alveolar cells themselves. So the bottom line is you have um, lungs in fact where there is good compliance, ease of expansion, but uh, the patients have great difficulty exhaling the air that's in the lungs because there is no elastic recoil. So they get what's known as hyperinflation of the lungs and uh, they also have issues with gas exchange because the actual surface area across the alveoli for gas exchange is also quite reduced. These individuals expend enormous amounts of energy on exhalation and you see a lot of overdevelopment of some of the muscles used in exhaling. Uh, they expend um, you know, up to half their caloric intake on uh, simply the act of breathing. So the next factor we're going to talk about with respect to uh, respiratory physiology is the actual process of gas exchange itself. And there are uh, two areas where gas exchange occurs. Uh, one is inside the lungs. Uh, this is where gas is exchanged between the air in the alveoli with pulmonary blood and we call that external respiration and gas exchange also occurs of course in um, in the tissues where gases are exchanged between tissue capillary blood and the interstitial fluid and cells of the tissues and we call this internal respiration so you have a little diagram here we're just going to look at uh, the direction of uh, gas movement so the circle on the left represents a lung alveolus and the red tubes represent uh, capillaries. The tissues, of course, are represented by the little things on the side that look sort of like, they look like eyeballs. They're cells. So if you could label the capillaries, we have pulmonary capillaries in the lungs, of course, and tissue capillaries in the organs of the body and the tissues of the body. And in external respiration, 
oxygen is high in alveolar air and oxygen moves down its concentration gradient from alveolar air into pulmonary capillary blood. This oxygen, of course, is transported to the tissues in the arteries of the body as uh, oxygenated blood is carried by hemoglobin. And when this oxygenated blood arrives in the tissues, the oxygen diffuses again down its concentration gradient into the interstitial fluid and uh, into the cells of the body. Carbon dioxide accumulates in the tissues of the body as a product of cellular respiration. When we metabolize uh, carbon compounds for energy, carbon dioxide is produced. So carbon dioxide concentrations are high in the cells and tissues of the body, particularly ones that are metabolically very active. This carbon dioxide diffuses down its concentration gradient into the tissue capillaries. And then this deoxygenated blood returns to uh, the heart and ultimately to the lungs. And in the lungs, carbon dioxide diffuses out of the pulmonary capillaries down its concentration gradient into uh, the alveoli of the lungs. The process of gas exchange that occurs in the lungs is called external respiration. The process of gas exchange that occurs in the tissues is internal respiration. bottom line is all of these gases diffuse down what you could think of as concentration gradients but which are in fact pressure gradients. They are moving from areas of high gas pressure to areas of lower gas pressure. Each gas will diffuse down its own pressure gradient. So oxygen will move from high partial pressure of oxygen to low partial pressure of oxygen and similarly for carbon dioxide. So partial pressure is a new concept, and it's the term used to describe the concentration of a gas when it's expressed as a percentage of atmospheric pressure. When you consider the air uh, around you, uh, the air that's in your lungs, it is actually a mixture of several gases and each gas will exert a certain amount of gas pressure. And the pressure exerted by each gas is the partial pressure of that particular gas. So if we consider atmospheric pressure to be 760 millimeters of mercury, which it would be in Victoria at sea level, we have uh, a pressure that is created by a number of different gases. And each of the gases in the atmospheric air will account for a proportion of atmospheric pressure. In the example shown at the bottom of the slide, we simply have two gases. And the total pressure in the flask is just 15 millimeters of mercury. But you will notice that the partial pressure of gas A is 10 millimeters of mercury. So that's about 2 thirds or 66% of the pressure exerted by uh, the gas, and gas B, just 5 millimeters of mercury, about 33% of the partial pressure of the total pressure in that flask. So let's consider atmospheric air, which of course is also the air that's taken into the alveoli. Air is only 21% oxygen. It's mainly nitrogen gas approximately 78% nitrogen gas, and carbon dioxide actually accounts for less than 1% of the partial pressure of atmospheric air. Now the only two gases we're really concerned with in gas exchange are oxygen and carbon dioxide. In fact, nitrogen is exchanged between alveolar air and the blood, but uh, it is not a gas that we use for any metabolic purposes, but it does circulate in the blood. So see if you can calculate the partial pressure of each of the, these three gases at sea level. Consider that each gas would be uh, calculated to have a partial pressure in millimeters of mercury and uh, assume that you are at 
sea level for this calculation. It's pretty simple math. We basically take 21% of 760 to determine the partial pressure of oxygen. So that's 160 millimeters of mercury. To calculate the partial pressure of nitrogen, you would take 78.6% of 760. That's approximately 600, 597 millimeters of mercury. And then carbon dioxide, you would take 0.4% of 760, which is approximately 3 millimeters of mercury. You should be able to calculate the partial pressure of uh, gases if you are given the atmospheric pressure or alveolar pressure or whatever pressure we're talking about. So consider the pictures below, which only show oxygen and nitrogen, keeping in mind carbon dioxide, although very important, is just a very small uh, proportion of that pressure exerted by uh, the air. Oxygen would make up about 159 millimeters of mercury and uh, 600 or so uh, millimeters of mercury pressure accounted for by nitrogen. And then the total pressure there would just be the sum of those two values. Recall that the movement of gases into or out of the blood, into or out of the tissues, is in fact driven by what we call pressure gradients. These are effectively diffusion gradients, but because gases uh, behave differently than other molecules, they expand to fill a space. We describe this as pressures, and gases always move from areas of high partial pressure to areas of low partial pressure. They move down their partial pressure gradient. A second consideration when we're talking about exchange of gases in the body is in order for any gas to move in or out of the blood, it must first dissolve in the interstitial fluids surrounding uh, the blood vessels. So in the example shown, the oxygen has to, in fact, dissolve in the interstitial fluid before it can move into the blood. So the solubility of gases is an important consideration when we're talking about gas exchange. They must dissolve in the fluids of the body. And ultimately, of course, they're dissolved in blood uh, where they are transported. So we're just going to label the interstitial fluid in the blood in the diagram pretty easy exercise. There's the blood and of course the interstitial fluid. If you take a look at this image just uh, briefly, we're going to come back to this in a moment, you'll notice that uh, deoxygenated or non-oxygenated blood, as they call it here, uh, even though there is some oxygen in it, is a prox has a partial pressure of oxygen of about 40 millimeters of mercury. And uh, as this pulmonary capillary blood passes by the alveoli in the lungs, uh, gas, oxygen gas moves down its pressure gradient from the alveoli, where the partial pressure is 100 millimeters of mercury, into pulmonary capillary blood. Now the gas will move uh, down its pressure gradient and it will move until equilibrium is reestablished. So the oxygenated blood that leaves the lungs has a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 millimeters of mercury, which was the partial pressure of oxygen in alveolar air. This is uh, basically a, a law called Henry's Law. And Henry's Law says that the amount of gas in a solution will be proportional to the partial pressure of that gas in air. Putting this in the context of the alveoli and pulmonary blood, gas, oxygen, for example, will move from alveolar air into pulmonary capillary blood until it achieves equilibrium. Similarly, carbon dioxide would move out of the blood into the air until equilibrium is achieved. The bottom line is you can't get any more oxygen in the blood than there is in the air, which kind of makes sense. So the bottom line is gas molecules will diffuse from the alveoli into the blood until uh, the concentration is basically the same or equilibrium is established. <laughs>
again to come back to pop bottles you can see this when you uncap a pop bottle the concentration of carbon dioxide in the soda pop is very very high it's been put in there under pressure and then when you remove the cap the carbon dioxide moves from high CO2 partial pressure in the soda pop into the air where CO2 partial pressure is lower and gases all bubble up and bubble out uh, until equilibrium is established. And in fact, if you leave your pop bottle uncapped, uh, the soda pop will go flat as all the carbon dioxide leaves. So let's take a look at uh, this image again and let's just put the numbers on it. Uh, you may already have done this, but let's take a look at them. Alveolar air uh, is indicated by the little uh, flower-like shape at the top, so you can label that as an alveolus. It has a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 millimeters of mercury. Now some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, didn't we just decide partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere was quite a bit higher than that? And you're right, and we'll get back to that in a moment. So oxygen, uh, deoxygenated blood arriving in the lungs from the body has a partial pressure of oxygen of about 40 millimeters of mercury. So oxygen will diffuse down its pressure gradient from the alveoli into the blood, and it will diffuse until equilibrium is established. That is, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is the same as it is in the alveoli, 100 millimeters of mercury. This blood is oxygenated. This oxygen will be uh, picked up by hemoglobin primarily. Some of it will remain dissolved in the blood, and it will be delivered to the body as oxygenated blood, which will have a partial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury. So this process that's illustrated in this particular image, is it internal or external respiration? External respiration. Exchange between alveolar air and blood. So you may have noticed the partial pressure of oxygen is lower in the alveoli than what it actually is in uh, the atmosphere. The reason for this is the air that's inside the lungs is in fact a mixture of inhaled and yet to be exhaled air. So you never have air inside the lungs that has the same concentration of all the gases as the air that you actually breathe in because there's always exchange occurring carbon dioxide moving into the lungs from the blood. So this graph just shows you that um, you will have diffusion of oxygen into a capillary. It will begin at the beginning of the capillary bed. As the blood becomes progressively more oxygenated, you achieve equilibrium. And uh, at the end of the capillary bed, you have oxygenated blood. So I think I already scooped the answer on this question to you. But air in the lung alveoli, in fact, is different from alveolar air because it's a mixture of newly inhaled and yet to be exhaled air. And in fact, the air in the alveoli has a much higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide and a lower partial pressure of oxygen than atmospheric air. So the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolar air is about 100 millimeters of mercury. Partial pressure of CO2 is about 40 millimeters of mercury, which is very different from what you see in the atmosphere. So here's a question for you. You can keep someone alive by exhaling into their uh, respiratory passages. It's artificial respiration, one of the things you might do in conjunction with CPR. When you exhale, the air that's leaving the lungs is this mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated air. And in fact, the air you exhale has a partial pressure of oxygen of about 100 in it. So there's actually quite a bit of oxygen in the air that you exhale, sufficient certainly to keep someone's blood oxygenated by the process of artificial respiration. So we have a big picture here that sort of summarizes uh, the gas exchange processes and uh, puts them in the context of the heart and the systemic and pulmonary circuits. So let's just label this diagram. External respiration, to remind you, is the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen between alveolar air and blood. 
So this, of course, occurs in the lungs. So deoxygenated blood arrives via the pulmonary arteries into the capillary beds of the lungs. Oxygen moves across the respiratory membrane into the blood, down its partial pressure gradient. Carbon dioxide moves out of the blood into the alveoli, down its partial pressure gradient. If we look at the partial pressures, of oxygen and carbon dioxide in deoxygenated blood. We have a partial pressure of oxygen of about 40. These are all in millimeters of mercury. And a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 45. This is deoxygenated blood. Alveolar air has a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40. Both gases move down their partial pressure gradients. Movement of both gases occurs until equilibrium is established. Henry's law. So the blood that leaves the lungs has a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40. There's no expectation here that you memorize these numbers but understand what is meant by uh, diffusion down a partial pressure gradient and understand the notion of Henry's law where uh, diffusion occurs until equilibrium is established. So this oxygenated blood returns to the left side of the heart, sent out to the body where internal respiration or exchange with the tissues of the body occurs. Internal respiration is exchange of CO2 and oxygen between tissue capillary blood and the tissues of the body. The blood that arrives is oxygenated, has a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 and a partial pressure of CO2 of 40. Exchange occurs in the tissues. Both gases move down their partial pressure gradients. In the tissues, oxygen levels are low, partial pressure of 40. Carbon dioxide levels are high. This is a result of metabolism and the process of cellular respiration. When the gases diffuse down their concentration gradients, oxygen moves out of the blood into the cells of the tissues and the interstitial fluid around them. Carbon dioxide moves from the interstitial fluid in the cells into the blood. Movement occurs until equilibrium is established. So the blood that returns to the right side of the heart, deoxygenated blood, has a partial pressure of oxygen of 40 and a partial pressure of CO2 of 45.